everybody. Welcome to the Get Wealth Podcast. Um, I have Rafael Cortez here today, broker, investor, entrepreneur, coach, doing it, doing it at a really high level. So excited to talk to you today. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Of course, man. Thanks for having me, man. Pleasure. So I wanted to start off, I always like to begin with how you got into real estate, because there's so many different ways. And mm -hmm. I know when I, before I did my first deal, it was like, you had to be a realtor. That's the only one I knew. So what, what yeah. was your story like? How did you get into it? And how did it turn into what it is now? So the, um, the, my path to real estate was, was a little, um, I mean, I really kind of fell into it by accident. I mean, I had another, um, I had another business and this is back in 2009. I had a transportation business, had nothing to do with real estate. Um, I just, what happened is that I launched another business and, um, and I started, you know, getting some cash through that. And I wanted to just diversify a little bit and then, uh, do something with, you know, kind of like the, the, uh, the money that I was putting together. Right. And then, um, I, I kind of fell by accident into, uh, uh, I had this conversation with a buddy of mine. He had flipped a couple of homes and he was like, yeah, you can make a lot of money and whatnot. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to go buy a house. Uh, so I, I bought a house from this, this other wholesaler and I don't know what wholesaling was back then. And, um, and I think I made, I don't know, I made it, dude, I, I, if I made $2 profit on that property, I mean, that's, that's being optimistic. I think <laughs> I broke even just about broke even. I didn't lose, uh, but I, it was a lot of work. And uh, my first experience, you know, coming into it without, you know, any guidance or direction, just trying to figure shit out as I went. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, uh, it was a lot of work for no pay, basically. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, the, uh, the um, elbow grease type of schooling. Uh, so it was, it was a flip. Yeah, the first one was a flip. I did it for my first flip in 2009. Um, yeah, but it, I, I mean, I did everything wrong on that thing. I, I did the work myself because, uh, you know, I felt like I was kind of handy. Uh, so I was like, all right, I'm going to go through the process of, of, you know, the tile and the painting and all that stuff. And then um, I didn't leverage it. So I bought it just flat out cash. Um, and I mean, it took me forever. It took me forever to go. I think that flip, that rehab project took me, I don't know, five months or something. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I, my numbers were off. It was just, I mean, it was crazy. Like the amount, if, if I were to put a punch list together of all the things I did wrong on that flip, I don't know how I didn't lose money, honestly. Well, I mean, if you were, if you still owned it today, you'd probably have actually came out pretty well. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, I ended up trying a couple of different things because I was going through the process of learning about, you know, just different strategies in real estate, right? And, uh, and one of them was, you know, wholesaling, and I was looking at lease options, and I ended up renting that property for a period of time uh, to a tenant that had no cash. So she had to pay me with a, another property that she owned up in northern Arizona. Uh, I mean, it was just, we ended up doing a lease option uh, and then taking it back. I mean, the whole thing, like the whole experience was a cluster, just getting it ready, just alone ready, took me five months and then getting rid of the property took me another, you know, set of months there, but yeah. So, so with that, with that being said, like my first experience in real estate, I was like, man, why do people do this? This is so much work. And like, you know, you don't make money. And like, I was just doing everything wrong. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, what kept you uh, in the business? <clears throat> Did you just have perseverance, wanted to try it again? How'd that go? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, I started going, you know, tapping into different spaces and talking to people who actually knew what they were doing, as opposed to me just going you know, around like a crazy person. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, through that process, like one of the, one of the things that I, that I, you know, I, I kind of saw consistently was like, all right, cool. You can't like, this is, this is a space that if you're going to be tapping into, uh, for example, fix and flip, right. That whole thing about saving cash, because I'm going to do the rehab like that, that, that she's got to go. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not, con it's not conducive to being a prosperous real estate investor. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was one of the things. Then it just started kind of, you know, tapping in and in, into, um, different talent, right. And, and other people's strengths. And, and I started talking to contractors and, and, you know, really leveraging the relationships around me as opposed to me doing all the work. Uh, so, I mean, that was one of the things and that just kind of, you know, gave me hope. Right. But yeah, no, I wasn't, um, I've, I've never been one to quit on the first, you know, uh, on the first go around is like, all right, I'm going to give it enough time to, to work. Uh, the second one was a little better. And then after that, it just started getting better. Eventually I, I, um, I, 
I I started paying attention, right? Because I was caught up in the in the in the doingness of of okay, cool. I'm, you know, this is what I need to do on the floor, on the paint, on the car, you know, whatever. Um, but I wasn't really looking at the transactional side of things. So I would just you know dump everything on title, and then they would handle everything, and I just whatever they told me to sign, I would sign. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and one day I started looking at uh, settlement statements and I see assignment fees on there. Like I made like two bucks on this flip and this person made 18, like what's, what's going on there? Uh, and like, and, and you know, I called them up, not, 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 you know, bash their heads in or anything, but like, bro, like what? So tell me about this. How, like, how, how is this going on? Like, and he's like, yeah, it's, that's my assignment. And they were kind of nervous. They thought I was going to be upset about it uh and and yeah it's it's an assignment fee i mean that's what i got for for getting you the property you know wholesale like that's fucking brilliant <laughs> <laughs> and uh and yeah so we you know can we meet up and then talk about that so he's uh like he was the first person that just kind of exposed me to it um eventually i started looking more into it and then learning more about wholesaling and just different strategies right but um but yeah i mean it was it was a revelation, like just going into real estate, you know, doing what I, you know, the, the whole, you know, swinging the hammer thing, because it's the only thing I knew. Uh, and then just, you know, coming to, to, uh, to uh, learn about different strategies and, and, and how vast, like how full of opportunity real estate is. I mean, it was just a game changer. Yeah. So is that <laughs> where you focus on now mostly is uh, wholesaling or what, what does your structure look like as far as flips versus wholesale versus like listing property. right now specifically we're just wholesaling yeah so I'm, I'm not i'm not intending on buying anything taking everything unless it's a killer deal um but for the next eight months or so and just because of where the market is at but yeah it's always been a mix of of uh, wholesaling and and fixing flipping so i own um at this point i own a, a couple of different companies one is ceo polls i'm an organizational psychologist and that's that's my background business coaching consulting and i coach on real estate right uh and then i own pulse capital which is um, my wholesale fix and flip business and then i own a real estate brokerage as well so now like the uh, the business just it's it's almost like this little ecosystem where they all talk to each other create opportunities for each other and 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 it works well uh, but the mix is i mean right now i mean we're we're 90% wholesale and then 10% you know kind of comes our way uh, for fix and flips. If it's there, we'll come in and, and do it. Otherwise we're just pushing stuff because, um, I mean, I want to wait for the first quarter of 2023. 20, uh, uh, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunity out there uh, to buy at deeper discounts. So, yeah. What's, uh, <clears throat> what's your prediction as far as the market? Do you think it's going to be a, a big drop or level off? What do you think? Prediction? I mean, it, it's a it's a heavy it's a heavy word, right? But I mean, I think I just I'm I'm looking at trends, and we don't know. I mean, the the, the crazy thing about human nature is that you know we we tend to react more on f emotions like fear, um, you know, optimism and that sort of thing, as opposed to stats and trends. So emotions, if they get, uh, you know, swayed in any particular direction, shit can change tomorrow, right, in the market space. But the way that I'm seeing it, I think, um, you know, we're, we're halfway through the year, 2022. Um, I feel like in the next around eight to 12 months, there's going to be more more opportunity out there for for investors as far as buying properties at a deeper discount building those portfolios and and you know really tapping into it because we i mean we've seen how crazy the price wins got right now if you're following market trends <clears throat> inventory i mean you're, you're looking at a it's not even a 45 degrees you know spike it's it's you know steeper than that in terms of available properties days in market are getting extended so it's taking longer for properties to sell than they were, you know, two months ago. And then sold properties are going, you know, in the total, totally different um, uh, direction, right? So, so it's just a matter of supply and demand. I feel like in in uh, in I mean, I don't know, somewhere around the first quarter of maybe twenty uh, two thousand and twenty three is when I'm, I'm gonna start considering buying stuff again. But right now, I'm just monetizing. Um, I have a couple of different strategies. I mean, we are. I did liquidate, you know, some of the holdings that I had, and in, in terms of just personal assets. Uh, so that's um, 
that's done. Uh, we're going heavy on the marketing side of things, direct to seller type of stuff, having those conversations with sellers. And, and I think we, I don't know, we have around 20 properties on whiteboard right now to be dispoed through my wholesale company. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's really what we're leveraging. And it, you know, a month ago, two months ago, people were still aiming for the moon and the stars, right. In, in terms of, you know, what I want for my beat up property. Um, but, uh, but, you know, slowly, but surely people started to get the memo. They start to, okay, realize that, hey, listen, you know, prices are dropping, um, inventory is it's increasing, and, and really, like, that, um, the, the high point, we're past that point. Uh, we're absolutely past that point, right? So now they're, they're a lot more receptive to, to have conversations. If you're a wholesaler right now and you put yourself in a decent spot where you can actually, you know, create relationships and build, you know, that rapport with sellers, it may take them a little bit, but if you're first in mind, uh, when they pull the trigger, which anybody who's who's been considering selling, I think is going to happen again within the next maybe six to twelve months. Um, you're going to be in a really good spot to to pull the trigger on 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 opportunities as they as they roll out, right? So anybody who's building that base, I think is going to be it's going to be um, doing very very well this time next year. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think that's right on point. Are you? What's your favorite marketing channel? Do you cold call or inbound marketing? Yeah. Cold yeah, call. so my two uh, two main channels is uh, cold calling um, and SMS. Cold calling and SMS. We generate anywhere from uh, 80 to about 120 leads a week through cold calling and text messaging. And, and there's a couple of different, you know, steps through the process, right? But the, the, the first one is always going to be sourcing. Uh, when I say generate leads, we're generating just interest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're not, you know, pre-qualifying. These are not, you know, so we generate leads and then we turn them into prospects and then we send them over to acquisitions. It's kind of like the, uh, the methodical process that I have behind the model. Uh, but yeah, we're, uh, my team is, we have five cold callers, a lead manager, uh, and then we also text message. So um, uh, with that, uh, the average, you know, uh, it's between 80 and 120 leads. We hardly ever go below 80 a week. Incredible. <clears throat> Have you noticed any, uh, any further, uh, difficulty selling these like as oh, yeah. higher? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, man. Um, they, the, uh, what's happening is that buyers are getting a lot more, um, conservative. Uh-huh. And it's just like anything else, right? Like people freak out about gas prices. People freak out about, you know, okay, where are the interest rates going? Uh, you know, and it, I don't know, the milk is going up. Same thing is going to be with investors. Uh, it doesn't matter how savvy you are, how you know long you've been in the game for. Um, there's going to be a a period of due diligence, and I think that's where uh, most investors who know what they're doing. That's where they're at, right? So they're buying. We have to get more aggressive on price points, and it's it's. Uh, think about it this way, right? It, it, I mean, it can be a little tricky because the the sellers haven't really completely gotten the memo on on prices and where you know where they're going to be able to sell. Um, but buyers are not, you know, paying as much as they they were paying, you know, a couple of months ago. That's what I uh, because saying. yeah, because properties are sitting right. So so we are we inevitably inevitably going to see a a, uh, a reduced uh, margin. You know, that's it's just what you know we're going to have to deal with that for a little bit. Um, but then you know we go back like right now our strategy is uh, we're implementing marketing strategies uh, for buyer campaigns so just like we always look for sellers right we go you know we, we drop campaigns specifically for sellers for absentee owners I and mean, when you call it there's so many avatars out there we're doing the same thing for buyers so we're running uh camp marketing campaigns on both sides sellers i mean because that's a constant it's the feel of the business but now we're uh, we're bolting on just buyer efforts uh on the uh, lead generation process uh, you, you just have to get proactive on it like slapping a, a property on on you know, on email and then blasting it out there is not gonna, you know, it's not gonna do the trick anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a much smaller operation than you. It's just me and my brother and a couple cold callers. But um, I've, I've found being able to have more time probably per deal to sell it. The best way is to just like reach out and call them directly. Yeah, because the Facebook groups and like Craigslist, it's, I mean, it's not nearly as effective as just getting on the phone with them. Uh, yeah. Is that is that part of your marketing is cold calling them and building a relationship? Yeah. Yeah. So we <clears throat> we have a pretty solid list. Uh, I mean, we have thousands of buyers and but we segment those lists. So we have a general list. Uh, we have a VAP list and then we have an A list. 
So the A list is uh, the people who get the phone calls. We actually jump on the phone and, hey, listen, and, and we're constantly just updating that short list. Most of our deals get sold through, uh, to the A list. And you're talking about, I think we have anywhere from I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 people in there. Uh, we keep it small intentionally. And then the, the VAP list, I think we have about, I don't know, 3,000 people on email. And then our big list is around, I think, 35 or 40,000 buyers or something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure where that's at. But it's, I mean, we've, we've been building that list. Well, I've been building that, li that list since 2009, right? So it's, it, it adds up. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with that being said, like most of the conversations have really, get, you know, happened at that segmented, you know, um, space. And if we, if we see no activity, no, no interest. I mean, we'll kick people out of that a list just to keep it effective. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's helping, but it's still, you know, even the people on the a list are like, Hey, listen, uh, you know, I need to get that at a much deeper discount. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. all right. So yeah, I don't like to do it, but sometimes like on some of the properties that we have on, on, on the board, like we, we've had to come back and then just renege and do whatever we need to. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like the <clears throat> traditionally you, the rule of thumb was like the 70% rule. And then the last couple yeah. of years, it's just been like inching up, inching up where now it's like ridiculous because everyone's just banking on it, appreciating another 50 grand by the time their flip is done. And so it's almost like going back to that 70% rule is where we'll be. Do you think, do you think 70% is right or is it even more? I, I think, I think so. I mean, and, and, uh, it's, it's a matter of, um, it's a matter of uh, trends, right? I think that's going to be the case for a while just because of where buyers are buying at. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? People are still expecting, you know, you know, for, to paint a picture, right? People are still expecting 80s, you know, offers in the you know, 80% minus repairs, minus fee and all that stuff, right? But the reality is that those properties, if you lock them up, unless there's something bigger behind it, like creative financing, uh, or you have another, uh, you know, strategy, like innovation strategy or something that can actually, you know, help you monetize at that level, mm -hmm. um, they're going to be a lot harder to sell, even for buy and hold buyers. I mean, unless you have a prime property in a prime area where, you know, that makes sense. Uh, for the most part, you have to, you like right now, we have to get a lot more aggressive on the offers. So yeah, we're at 72% right now. So 72 minus, minus the repairs and, and, and fees. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how the, uh, the entire industry changes because the last few years, it's been the, the best thing ever to be in real estate, right? Like you can't lose, you do a deal and you think you're yeah. on top of the world. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, for me personally, I'm kind of excited to do the dirty work and just stick through it all, even if it's going to be a, a a bit of a winter here. I think that's where the real foundation is built. It's uh, I, I like that you put it that way, right? I, I don't know. A couple of weeks ago, I, I put out a video on on the seasons, and we we're talking about seasons of life and 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 how things you know work. And this reminds me of that, really. I mean, yeah, we may be coming into a you know somewhat of a winter season. There's still gonna be stuff. I mean, if, if you planted stuff and you you know you were able to harvest and all that, you're gonna be okay, right? And that's where I I feel like that people who actually started running business or running wholesaling and real estate, like a business, as opposed to, to, uh, to hustling, you know, through the next deal and build that, that uh, took the time to build those relationships, that consistency and, and, and you know, that uh, methodical approach to things. Um, they're going to be okay through the winter. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just seasons, man. It's yeah. just seasons. Yeah. So you mentioned you do quite a bit as far as, all your businesses, what, what do you enjoy the most? Like the coaching, the real estate, the talking to sellers, what's your, what gets you excited? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think for sure it's, it's going to be the coaching. I mean, I, I, I do that even, at, uh, you know, at, I'm at that capacity in the businesses. So in the business, mo most of my time is spent coaching my team and then training and all that stuff. I don't spend um, a lot of time anymore on the, um, uh, you know, seller appointments and, and every now and then I'll, I'll you know, like to come, you know, jump into that kind of stuff to stay, stay relevant. Um, but, but it's, uh, it's really <clears throat> when you're, when you have to coach something, you, you have to clarify it in your mind, right? So you can articulate it. So you can explain it. Somebody understands it. So if I'm trying to teach, you know, or explain the, the newest, 
I don't know, you know, say the, you know, the changes in, in cold calling, right? Okay, this is going to be the uh, the specific process that we need to do in terms of cold calling. Uh, for me to teach it to somebody else, I have to understand it, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I love it because it really clarifies my my thought process in that space. And then I teach it to somebody else, they take it and they run with it. Um, so so it's really one of the, uh, I think it's one of the best things that we can do as, as entrepreneurs, as business owners is, okay, take the time, even if you're not, you know, coaching, uh, you know, as a, as a business, right? Uh, but take the time to actually coach the people around you, coach your team, coach and anybody who reaches out for help, uh, you know, heck, you know, okay, cool, go through that process because it's going to help you um, clarify your, your thoughts and, and, um, and really, you know, put everything into perspective because you have to push it that way. Otherwise people don't understand it. Right. So, yeah, I think it's one of my, it's one of my favorite things to do, honestly. That's a, yeah. a good perspective. Most people would, I mean, especially at your level, when someone is, asking for your time it's like okay i'm gonna give you my time like what do i get back but you don't realize that you're actually sharpening your own blade more so than yeah. if you were to do it another way right you're teaching it like you said that's pretty cool yeah yeah exactly so just i mean having that mentality when when you know people make it into your team i see it happen you know i hit dude i see it happen all the time where yeah i'm gonna hire somebody and then you know, go home, you know, go and execute, but there's no, um, there's no, uh, you got to have a business structure for things to, to come in and make sense. You got to give people a platform to operate from if you're building a business. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, when it, when it's a solo operation, it might be a little different. You may, you know, like, I remember, I didn't feel like I had to run based off of systems uh, when I was running, but you know, when I was doing it myself, right. Because I was cold calling, I was then going on the appointments and I was just going to deals and I had everything on my cell phone and all that stuff. Um, but I couldn't, take a vacation because my business stopped. I couldn't, you know, I don't know, like if I got sick, man, I'm screwed. You know what I mean? That type of stuff. So it wasn't, um, even if you're running by yourself, it doesn't mean that you can't be methodical about the steps and the process that you're, you're taking. You know what I mean? Um, when you clarify it and, and you understand what the, uh, like what the outline of, of the, the life of the business, the life of the deal looks like, um, you're, you're able to, okay, cool. Like, for example, for me, realizing that I didn't want to cold call. It, it's the best marketing strategy, in my opinion, right? I didn't want to do it myself, though. Like, okay, cool. I need to plug somebody into that space of business. But my acquisitions person is not cold calling because it's a different role, different strengths, uh, different behavioral uh, tendencies, you know, that are needed for that specific role. So so understanding, like, where all the pieces just kind of, you know, match, it's, it's, to me, it's a really, I mean, I, I geek out on this stuff all the time, but it's a really fascinating thing because you're able to put people and systems together, and then that creates the, you know, the machine that we're looking for as entrepreneurs. So I'm sure as a coach, you, you run into a lot of um, obstacles that people bring to yeah. you. Like, how, how do I fix this? Is, uh, and I'm sure you've seen it all. Do, do you think you see more of the, their systems and processes aren't working or their sales technique, or do you see more <clears throat> mindset related issues? It's a really good question, man. Um, people, uh, let, let me put it to you this way, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I trick people, <laughs> I trick students into uh, into coaching through the systems, right? Um, through the process and, and, you know, it's the blueprint, all right? This is the methodical approach, the step-by-step, -step, you know, it's, it's practical, it's pragmatic. Do this this one day, do this the next day, do this the next, it's not theoretical, right? So people want to have, you know, a, a, a good anchor on that. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the practical steps to take when you're, you know, going through this, this whole thing, right? However, uh, mindset is 80% of the stuff that's holding people back. It's not, you know, that's what you see, uh, you know, people who've been, yeah, I've been studying up on, on wholesaling for the last two years. How many calls have you made? Uh, no, and I mean, I called sellers, you know, it was like five last month. Like, no, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you see that all the time, but it's really a mindset block. It's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's one, we're, we're going to have a natural uh, fear of rejection. That's going to be, it's, I mean, it's just part of human nature, right? People don't want to feel rejected. Uh, I don't care who you are. If you're rejected by, you know, anybody, loved ones or, or hell, even sometimes in social media, people you don't know, you know, that can be, you know, coming across as, as you know, rejection makes you feel bad, right? So we try to stay away from feelings and emotions like that. Um, uncertainty is a big one. Um, uh, procrastination really stems from, from, uh, from, or analysis paralysis really stems from, 
you know, from that fear of, of or, or uncertainty of, okay, what if, what if I get, you know, if I do this and I, I get nowhere um, or, you know, I don't want to have this conversation with this, you know, the seller, because I don't want to, you know, intrude in, in their personal, you know, life and they're probably having dinner. And we start making all these stories up in, in our minds. At the end of the day, it really comes down to like the basic um, emotion of, of fear, right? That'll create uncertainty. That'll create doubt. That'll create procrastination. That'll create a lot of things. And you may know the, the steps. Okay, cool. I know I need to pull a list. You know, it's not rocket science. I need to, I just skip that, trace that list. Okay, cool. Start calling those numbers, right? How you do it, it's different, right? Through a dialer, through your cell phone, through whatever, but it's there. And then I'm going to ask them simple. I mean, if you were to bring it back to just, um, you know, the, the, the raw essentials, right? I'm going to ask them if they want to sell their property and then do it again and then do it, do it again. If I get a deal, I'm going to you know, sell that contract. Okay. So it's, you know, a few steps really that it's not, they're not too complicated. However, fear gets at the very forefront of that whole process and it stops people in their tracks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the biggest, the biggest challenge, the biggest, actually most of our conversations we have, like I have coaching calls every single week and, um, and I jump on those and yeah, we'll talk about deals. We'll talk about strategy. We'll talk creative financing. And this is how you, you know, structure this, this way or offer the seller this, or, you know, try to negotiate this deal this way. Um, I get it. Like, I kid you not 75 to 80% of the time we're talking about, uh, the mindset blocks. We're talking about the stuff that's going to create actionable momentum in your business. Uh, and, and it's, it's a huge, huge thing. I mean, how many, have you had that, uh, you know, happen to you in terms of, um, confidence? Initially, I think <laughs> yes, because what got me started into real estate wasn't um, the same thing that kept me going. I mm -hmm. think when I started, it was a cool opportunity and I watched a YouTube video and I just grossly underestimated the amount of work. But then once <laughs> I got a taste of it, I actually realized the amount of opportunity that's out there and it transformed more into like my why and my motivation and the, yeah. the deep, deeper level stuff. Um, and so that kind of helped me get through all the, the fear, but cause it doesn't really go away that much. I mean, yeah, once you do it, you're less, you're less uncertain about that, but there's always like bigger things, you know? <clears throat> yeah. And, and, uh, crazy thing, right? Like you still get butterflies and, and like that feeling in your belly is you're like, shit, I got a seller appointment or I gotta, <laughs> I gotta yeah. drop an offer on this. Like, okay. I mean, and it happens. Like, I still get it. I've been on, 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 I don't know, I've done over a thousand deals at this point. And, wow. and, uh, and I mean, I, I was going on an average of five seller appointments, physical seller appointments a day for a period of three years. Um, so like I've been on a bunch of them and it's still, you know, it's still something that, you know, kind of bubbles up. So do you feel like what you've done so far, you've set yourself <laughs> up for the rest of your life with, I guess, like assets and like your, your lifestyle? No. Is no, 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 no. The, the short, like the, the straight up short answer is no, uh, not, not there yet. Just because I, we're revolving beings. Right. So when I was, when I was 20, uh, I had a, I had a dream life. Right. Mm. And, and I, you know, throughout the process, I kind of, you know, I hit that, I hit that dream life. Mm. And then you get to that, um, to that point where like, Oh shit. Well, well I mean, what's next? Yeah. You know, I built the company. I sold it for a bunch of cash. I mean, that was like, I was supposed to do that when I was like 60. Uh, and then, you know, what happens now? Like, does, does the motivation go away? Does your desire to, you know, continue and push, you know, pushing forward go away? Um, I, I don't, I don't think it does. I really just think, I think that it evolves along with you. So just my picture of life and, and, and impact, um, you know, assets play a role into it, but assets go hand in hand with, with, um, concepts like survival uh you know and and that sort of thing right well i think when you have an um an internal driver mm -hmm. that uh, that pushes you every single morning that's a lot more powerful uh and it doesn't the, you know the the fuel doesn't run out of that for example if you have a number in your head i, I don't know i want to make i want to get to a point where i'm making a hundred thousand dollars a month All right cool you you hit that and then you go like, shit, I made, okay, cool. What's next. And then that, you know, that, uh, that drive, you know what I mean? If it doesn't evolve can just kind of start fading away. Right. And you either, you know, stay in that space and it becomes a, a, a normal, a constant and, and the achievement, the sense of achievement just kind of fades uh, along with it. Or you can, you know, tap into your, to me, it was really understanding what I wanted as an individual. Right. I know that empowerment, 
uh, empowering entrepreneurship for me uh, is a lot more important than hitting that next number, right? Uh, it's not going to feel like that when, when, when we're caught up in survival mode. Um, if we're in survival mode, we don't get to shits about empowerment. We don't get to, you know, about inspiration or, or you know, you may, you know, help people as they come along and whatnot, but, but you're going to be your priority. Why? Because you're in survival mode. Um, once you, you get out of that space, uh, you know, both, you know, financially and, and mentally, uh, the, the, uh, I think the, um, the things that drive us, the things that propel us, you know, they change, Right. Uh, that's why you see so many people going from, you know, deals to deals to deals to deals to like, you know, I want to, I want to cont contribute. It's a deeper sense of meaning. It's a deeper, you know, a deeper sense of a, a deeper desire for impact. Right. And I think, I think uh, setting yourself up for life <clears throat> saying, okay, cool. I know, you know, I know, I know I'm going to be okay. Right. But I don't think I'm set for life in terms of like, I'd go crazy if I didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I didn't do it. And that's, yeah. a, that's a great answer. And what, what, what's crazy about that is most people plan on getting to that, like out of survival mode when they retire, like they've saved up a big enough, est, uh, a big enough nest egg where they can, for some reason, like not work when like yeah. the, the scenario that you're painting, it's like, I'm 20, whatever years old. And now I'm out of survival mode and I can really experience <clears throat> the next 40 years, you know, do you yeah. think that like real estate, is the best opportunity to, it seems like it's, you can go out of survival mode so quickly compared to what the normal <clears throat> standard is. Oh, a thousand that? percent, man. Yeah. I, yeah. thousand percent. Um, I, I keep saying, right. It's a great vehicle, uh, f for life period. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> real estate gives you the opportunity to do the stuff that you like. <laughs> like one deal can change <laughs> it, everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, you get hit with a 70, $80,000 deal and it's, you're not used to that kind of cash. So my, my, uh, my financial thermostat, I, I became a firefighter when I was 19. Um, I, I grew up in a mobile home, you know, humble beginnings. And, and so I didn't, you know, I didn't have that exposure to financial wealth. Right. I, I didn't, I never even heard the phrase. Um, and, and I became a firefighter when I was 19. So my, like my financial thermostat was, you know, hovering around the $60,000 a year, you know, range. And I thought I was balling. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the, you know, you can't do a lot with that. You know what I mean? There, you know, I was, I remember thinking, man, I wish I could take a vacation. I wish I could do, you know, this, I wish I could do that. And I wish, it, you know, I, I'd see just, you know, things being enjoyed out in the world. And I still felt, you know, it felt restricted. It, like it hadn't dawned on me that, that it's, it's, you know, financial freedom gives you that, uh, that uh, ability to, to own your options. Right. So so to kind of, you know, bring it and bring it to, uh, to perspective, it's, it's jumping into real estate and then tapping into this, this breaking out of that financial, you know, thermostat barrier that I have, that I had, it was, I mean, was a game changer. Why? Because now it's, I can do more of me, right? I can do more of, you know, whatever, you know, my has the best representation of me is. If that's to travel, I can travel more. If that's to impact people, I can impact more people. And it's, it's an instrument, right? And the vehicle for that is, is real estate. To me, it's real estate. If I were to start a lower again, I would have started straight up, like right out of the gate with wholesaling. Wholesaling, I mean, I still got my license and all that stuff, but it would have been my, my first, you know, first pit stop. <laughs> yeah. So let's say you were, um, for whatever reason, dropped in a random spot in the middle of the country uh, with all of the knowledge you have now, but none of like the liquid resources, how would you go from mm. zero to hero? <clears throat> I love that question, man. Uh, first thing I would start uh, going to all the title companies or title attorneys, depending on you know where you're at. So if you're listening, take a note of this because they, they're a very, very good resource. You got to start your, whatever you do with the power team. Right. We always talk about, you know, the people who we surround ourselves with and, and all that stuff. Right. In business, I call that your power. Team. Um, go to uh, go to title agencies with all the knowledge that I have right now. I understand that I have to find a seller. Right. What do sellers look like? There's different types of um, situational distress, circumstantial distress, physical distress. So there's different types of distress. Right. I'm going to go after a list. Title companies are tapped into data. OK, so the reason I'm going to go to title company first and I'm going to talk to the marketing rep, not the escrow officer. I'm going to go straight for the marketing rep. I'm going to have a conversation with that marketing rep and I'm going to tell him, hey, listen, I'm dropping massive campaigns in this area and I want to bring the deals over to you guys. Can, what resources do you guys have that I can tap into? OK, 
That's mm. the first one. It's the first thing I, I would do. All right. That's really good. Okay. During, um, I mean, if they, they're going to give you, okay, they're going to say, listen, we have data that we can give you. We can give lists and we can do this. We can do that. I mean, I've had title companies give me access to preliminary title reports and, and just software that I can run prelim title reports and, you know, things that are, um, you know, they can be a pretty penny, right? But, yeah. you know, tapping into, into those relationships can help. So I would do that. I would pull lists. 60-day um, late list is a really good one. It's not uh, foreclosure. They're just late 60 days. Uh, but they're they're on their way to you know to getting a a, um, um, a notice. Yeah, notice, right? So not everybody and their mom like you know pre foreclosure listings are you know they're not getting hit like like those people yet, but they're on that right. path. So that's a good list that I would tap into. Um, a lot of times they'll give you uh, phone numbers and and you work with what you can, right? So at the very least, I would go for the uh, sixty day lates and the pre foreclosures. Look at those addresses and start creating routes, and then go uh, go door knocking on those. Uh, my cup of tea is not it's not, it's not door knocking, you know. Yeah. It's like I'm not I, like I, I've done it. I've done it where I go to the door and then I try to strike up a cold conversation with sellers. To me, that freaks. I mean, it just freaks me out, right? Um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm relatively a private person. So I, like, I feel like I'm in, in, intruding somebody else's privacy. And anyways, I, so my approach to that, when I was, um, doing things like that, I was a post-it. So I'd get a list again, to recap, get a list from a title company, put up, put together a, a, an address, either go door knocking or do a post-it and then drop your number on it. And Hey, this is Rafael. I, I stopped by earlier. Can you please give me a call back at whatever number? Boom. Slap it on the door. Um, they're going to reach back out to you. Uh, another thing that you can do, of course, is start skip tracing those properties. Uh, if you already have the number from the record or from the list that the title company gave you, just dial, like pick up the phone and then have a simple, simple conversation, um, you know, uh, regarding the, the potential offer on a house, right? That's the first thing I would, I would start doing. But uh, the hottest, I mean, I, I feel like we're always looking for that. What's the hot list, the best list. Everybody sells, bro. Everybody sells. Um, but I think when you're talking about limited funds, uh, you know, you're going to have to put some some extra work into into the mix, right? In the form of you know driving for dollars, uh, you know, doing things like door knocking and still having those conversations. But I would keep building my my um, my um, my power team that way, right? First thing I would do build a power team. Another thing that you can do if you don't have a buyer's list, start going to meetups, uh, look at, go to meetup.com and, and, and look up any real estate investments that are going on in your area, right? And then start talking to actual cash buyers. All right, partner up with them and tell them, hey, listen, if I bring you a deal, uh, I mean, would you, would you be game to partnering up on it? Um, basically, what you're trying to do at this point is to have the validity uh, of a, a, or backup of an actual buyer, right? So when you go to a seller, you're not bullshitting them, telling them, hey, listen, I can buy the property. If it's a good enough deal, you know, you have a partner that you can bring, you know, partner up with. So if you put me on a, you know, any city, those are going to be two of the first things that I start doing, right? Building the power team and then connecting straight up with title companies. That's so cool. That's, I, <clears throat> I never even thought about the going straight to the title company first. That's a really good um, hmm. a really good idea. Yeah, it works, man. It works. So that 60 day late list, can you get that from a title company? Yeah. Uh, Fidelity title gives us, uh, gives it to, to us. And what we do at this point is we're in a drip campaign. So I have a, I have a drip campaign set up for 60 day late list, uh, another drip. Basically anytime they get data, it makes it over to my inbox. Uh, and I mean, we start getting just records on a, on a regular boom, boom, boom. And th those are, I mean, they're free records, right? Uh, we still skip trace. We, we take those lists and skip trace because we want to have the most accurate data um, mm. in terms of phone numbers, right? But uh, but the the records are, are are pretty solid. The numbers, I mean, it's got to be a hit and miss just because they don't correlate. They, they don't, you know, spend so much money on the data uh, itself, like the correlation of numbers. Um, but, uh, but if you take even a list like that and then just, you know, throw it into skip tracing, you're going to be fine. That's awesome. <clears throat> One of the cool lists that I've heard of recently, um, I actually tried it in my local town, Prescott. Uh, Arizona is the water shutoff list calling the mm. utility services and yep. asking them if anybody's missed their payment or like get a list of all that. But the one in Prescott wouldn't give it to me. So <laughs> I don't, I, I've heard you can kind of press them and they eventually give it, but that's no, like it, you, you catch, you catch a lot more honeys with, or, or what's the saying? You catch a lot more bees with honey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
or flies with honey or something like that. Something I mean, like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I, I totally butchered that. But but it's it's uh it's again it's relationships, man. Real estate is a it's a relationship business. It's not a transactional business. It, it's a place where where you can create dude, I mean, you can have two relationships that are really solid key relationships and those just skyrocket your your income. And the next thing you know, I mean, you're not thinking about, you know, paying a mortgage. You're thinking about shit, what's the next badass car I'm gonna buy? You know what I mean? Uh so it's it's um it's a very I think it's the most powerful vehicle for wealth out there, definitely. And there's so many different ways to 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 play in the space of real estate. Um, I, I mean, I'm absolutely real estate and I'm not doing transactional stuff. So I'm not, you know, even through the brokerage and all that stuff, right? And I, I'm, I'm, um, I have agents and, you know, they do their thing, but I'm playing in that, you know, real estate space. Uh, and I'm not dealing with, you know, spuds and I'm not dealing with, you know, you know, headaches like that. Anyways, stuff that I don't like, you can be selective. Like there's a way of, of working around that kind of stuff. Totally. <clears throat> yeah. Uh well, um, a few few questions I always like to ask to kind of wrap things up. One of them is, uh, what's a, a good book you'd recommend? Real estate related, life, personal development, just in general. Um, one of my favorite books is Psycho Cybernetics hmm. by Max Wilmots. Um, it's a really good on. I mean, the guys, the guy was. Uh, the author, is, he was a surgeon, plastic surgeon, but he wrote a really, really good book on psychology. <laughs> wow. So, so yeah, psychology, self-image. I think, it's, again, it's one of the biggest, uh, biggest challenges that a lot of people come across. I know, I mean, I went through that, through that whole, you know, stage. And again, when you're trying to reset your financial thermostat, when you're trying to reset your vision, your perspective, when you try to think bigger, uh, it's easy to, you know, read it on a, you know, on a, on a, I don't know, on a frame, right? And then, oh, okay, cool. That sounds awesome. But to believe it, to actually adopt it and take the steps to be, you know, to rationalize the steps that we need to take and really make it part of what part of all us is it's a completely different thing right that book does a really really good job about lining things up and then um helping you shift that uh you know that perspective we, we have of ourselves uh and that psychology that we operate from uh in a in a very pragmatic way so hmm. psycho cybernetics <clears throat> that's, that's a good one I've, I've heard of that before um yeah and that's that's the second time i've heard someone recommend that so it must be good uh if you hear oh, yeah that. it's calling you <laughs> <laughs> um and then lastly i was like to ask to get wealth podcast what's your definition of wealth uh definition of wealth is owning my options mm. it's owning my options um yeah simple as that right uh, i want to be able to you know, be at the office. If I want to be at the office, I want to be able to take a trip. If I want to take a trip, um, choose the people that I want to work with, you know, um, owning my options. It's, it's to me, it's the ultimate definition yeah. <laughs> of wealth. Right. And I mean, that comes at, you know, financial, emotional, physical, and, and you know, and, and every aspect of relationships. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think that resonates with a lot of people. So I agree. Yeah. Hey, man, <laughs> I, I really stuff, appreciate man. you coming on the show. Uh, I think you packed it with value every every minute. I'm going to be going back and watching this and uh, sharing it as much as possible. So um, thanks for coming on the show. Do you want to plug your websites, social media, that good stuff? My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, um, I. if anybody wants to find me, I'm pretty active on social media at Rafael Cortez, CEO, I, Instagram, IG mainly. Uh, I do Facebook and whatnot, but uh, Rafael Cortez, CEO, uh, YouTube channel. I drop a lot of videos on, on, I have a podcast, the Seopolis podcast, and then I drop series on entrepreneur mindset, uh, business development strategies, and then of course, wholesaling as well. Uh, and I do have a coaching program for wholesaling. And if you go to reiwholesaling.com, uh, that's reiwholesaling.com, um, you can download a blueprint of the whole process, what it looks like and the different stages that we have with like within the wholesale business. All so, right. Yeah. Rafael Cortez, everybody, get wealthy. <laughs> See ya. <Boom>. Cool. <clears throat>